Okay. Um, the last. Uh, okay. Here's the game plan for the rest of the course. Um, today, I'm going to talk about Danzig Wolf decomposition. There's a section in. Uh, uh, there's a paragraph in section 5.5 of the book that shows you Danzig Wolf applied to to stage stochastic programming. It takes it as granted that you know what Danzig Wolf decomposition is, and I'm not assuming. Um, so I think the reason I wanted to cover that last piece of material is I think it's another useful tool in your toolbox. It's another decomposition algorithm. Um, but because I'm not assuming you know what the theory is based on, I wanted to cover it based on uh, Dimitri Bertima's uh, book. It's a linear programming classic book. Um, I've just printed out the part of the book that's on uh, Danzig Wolf. Um, okay, so that said, uh, this lecture I want to talk about the theory behind Danzig Wolf. Next lecture I'm going to talk a bit about its application in two stage stochastic programming. We're basically going to arrive at the L shaped algorithm just from a completely different direction. And then also next week, I'd like to spend uh, two or three hours doing some um, training section for like a training exercises for uh, exam type questions. So probably cover last year's uh, two exams, the September and the June exam. Uh, so we're gonna probably gonna split that between Matthew and myself, but also if you can bring in questions that will make the magistral and the training section much, much more useful for everybody. And then last week are the presentations. That's the plan, okay? That said, let's jump into Danzig Wolf. Um, and I'm out of battery. Okay, so um, the motivation behind the theory we're going to cover today is um, the application of Danzig Wolf decomposition on uh, two stage stochastic programming. Now, the standard shape of the linear programs that we've seen so far. Not even the pointer is working. Does anyone have? <laughs> Any? That's good because you're still <laughs> master students. Um, no, it's working. Okay. This is the standard structure of the two-stage stochastic program that we've seen so far, and basically, um, the trick uh, with the algorithms we've seen so far is to uh, just look at this part of the constraints and ignore. All of this, uh, all of these constraints, as if they did not exist. So the L-shaped algorithm that we've seen so far is appropriate for linear programs that have this specific structure. If your linear program doesn't look like this, you probably don't want to apply the L-shaped algorithm. It's a bad idea. Now, the Danzig-Wolf decomposition algorithm that we'll, we're going to talk about today works well when you apply it to linear programs that look like this. No um, pointer today. Um, so you, what you want, you basically see that uh, this constraint matrix and this constraint matrix are like the transpose of each other. Um, so how do we get the transpose of a linear program? Uh, we basically look at its dual. When you take the dual of a linear program, uh, the constraint matrix of the dual is, has, uh, is, looks like the transpose of the original uh, linear program. So the Danzig Wolf decomposition algorithm that I'm going to talk today, which works well for linear programs of this shape, we would not want to apply it directly to a two-stage stochastic program. We would want to apply it to its dual. It wouldn't make sense to apply it directly. But uh, before talking about how Danzig Wolf applies to the dual, uh, problem, let's talk about the algorithm. So the sources here are a presentation by Gerdin Fanger, who um, is a pioneer in stochastic programming, a consultant in Silicon Valley, and also a part-time professor in Stanford University, and also the Bertsimach book that I gave you. So I don't, uh, Jared's presentation is online, and I'll also put it on iCampus, but Bertsimach's book is not. Uh, available, which is why I gave you printouts. 
Okay, so what does a typical uh, linear program look like that uh, we want to apply Danzig Wolf decomposition? Well, it has this um, structure that I was talking about earlier. You can see here uh, how this structure looks like uh, what I showed you earlier. Because what we have in the constraint matrix is basically uh, A1, A2, B1, um, and uh, B2 over here. So this is exactly the upper triangular structure that we want to apply. Uh, Danzig Wolf too. Um, now, when you look at linear programs of this type, they typically correspond to something that has multiple time stages, and the A matrix corresponds to stuff you're deciding in the first time stage. When you look at linear programs of this type, they typically correspond to some organization that has multiple divisions, and these, the, this row here is coupling the decisions among different divisions of, for example, a company. And then the other mat uh, matrices here are local constraints of each division of the company that are independent. So the way to think about this linear program here is we've got two divisions in a company, division one and division two. They're each doing their own thing, but they also have to coordinate in some way, okay? Um, so what we have here, I'm reporting the dimension, so n1 uh, dimensional vector for x1, n2 dimensional uh, space for x2, m0 coupling constraints, these complicating constraints over here, and m1 and m2 uh, rows in these constraints over here. Now, this is expressed in the primal form when you want to apply Danzig Wolf to stochastic programming, this is, will be the shape of the dual problem of a two-stage uh, stochastic program. So you won't have x's anymore. You will have the dual variables of, of the stochastic program. But let's think of this as the prototypical situation of our problem. OK, so here's um, the approach is pretty different in philosophy to what we've seen so far. Um, what we saw for two-stage stochastic linear programs was, let's just think what we need to do in the first stage, and then worry about the cost impacts in the future, and then create value functions that bring information back. The idea here is uh, different. The idea will be um, to express to get rid of these constraints by using uh, Minkowski's representation theorem, which sounds like a complicated thing, but it's geometrically very intuitive, and you've probably seen it before in linear programming classes. So here's what Minkowski's representation theorem says. It says, take a polyhedron, P, um, you give me any point x in that polyhedron, I can, I can um, express it as a convex combination of the extreme points of the polyhedron plus uh, non-negative contributions from the extreme rays. Let's see a figure of what that means. So notation first, x super, yes? So what's the y's? Uh, y's, are there y's? W's, j's? Lambda is mu. Oh, what the what are extreme rays? Okay, okay. Um, in a in a polyhedron. Um, we all know what are extreme points. They're basically geometrically the corners of the polyhedron. So they are, if this is my polyhedron, they are points that cannot be expressed as linear combinations of other points. Rays are uh, um, directions that cannot be expressed as linear combinations of 
as convex combinations of other directions. For example, this is a direction in this polyhedron. Well, I can express this guy as a convex combination of two other uh, uh, directions within the same polyhedron. But if I take this guy over here, there's, there's nobody from this side to contribute. So this is an extreme ray. Um, this, is this an extreme ray? Be careful. Rays are uh, half lines. So if I move in, indefinitely in this direction, I will not stay forever in this polyhedron. Sorry, here I should have written. Okay. okay. Sorry. And so this is my point. So for example, this is an extreme ray, this is not. It cannot be expressed as a convex combination, but if I move along it, I'm out of the polyhedron. Okay. So notation is uh, lambdas are the weights on the extreme points, mu's are the weights on the extreme rays, uh, j superscript is for extreme points, r superscript is for extreme rays, and the w's are the extreme rays, the x superscript j are the extreme points. Okay, here I'm taking the convex combination of extreme points, and the lambdas and the mu's are non negative. Here in the drawing, kind of like what I just drew over there. So we have the gray area is our polyhedron. It has three extreme points, one, two, three, and it has two extreme rays, um, W1 and W2. You tell me any point you like in this gray area, for example, X, I can express it. Um, so here in this example I've expressed it, it's not the only option, but I can do this. I can take a convex combination of x2 and x3, so that will put me somewhere on this line. In particular, I will choose to land here. And then I'm going to take the direction of w2 to move up to this guy to land on x. So Minkowski's representation theorem is very intuitive. You give me a polyhedron, I can express any point x in this polyhedron, as a convex combination of the extreme points and a non-negative contribution from the extreme rays. So why do we care? Well, what we're going to do, the trick of the algorithm that we're going to apply is ignore the, these constraints over here, re-express them using Minkowski, basically. So um, here's one polyhedron, B1, X1 equals D1. Suppose I knew all the extreme points all its extreme points and extreme rays. I'm going to denote them as lambda 1 and nu 1. And I'm going to rewrite this polyhedron as this bunch of constraints over here. Uh, yes? The extreme points and rays are x1 and x1. Come again. The extreme points and rays it's x1 and x1. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, this now becomes data in my problem. And X as a decision in the original problem here, it was a decision variable. But now instead of deciding over X, I'm going to be deciding over lambdas and nu's. And the extreme points and extreme rays become data for my problem. It's really the same optimization problem, just expressed in a different way. Okay. So I'm going to do the same trick for the second polyhedron, B2x2 equals D2. And what I get is something that looks ugly, but it's not really that uh, bad. So let's see how the whole problem changes. Anything, any x1 that belongs in the first polyhedron, I'm going to write it according to Minkowski's uh, representation theorem. The same for x2. So then how does my new... Uh, reformulated problem look like? Well, let's take, for example, the coupling constraint. Wherever I see x1, I'm going to plug in Minkowski's formula. Wherever I see x2, I'm going to plug in Minkowski's formula. So I get this linear program, uh, li linear constraint over here, but now the decisions are the lambdas and the mu's, not the x's anymore. It looks ugly, but it's not that terrible. It's just a lot of fussy. Notation. I'm going to do that for every part of the linear program, for the objective function, and um, what I get is basically this thing.
thing here. So this is still the problem I'm trying to solve. Okay, it's just that now, instead of deciding over x's, I'm deciding over weights of lambdas and mu's. And um, what I've done, let's, so let's think a bit about this problem and compare it to the original problem. Does it have more variables or fewer variables than the original problem? The original problem, like I mentioned in the third or fourth slide, had n1 dimensional vector x1 and two dimensional vector x2. So it has n1 plus n2 decisions. How about this problem? Depends on the shape. But typically? Bigger or smaller? Exactly. Enormous. Basically. Typically a polyhedron, worst case, has an exponential number of extreme points and extreme rates. So the problem is huge in terms of decision variables. How about in terms of number of constraints? Bigger or smaller? Smaller. You get rid of the uh, two uh, constraints of this type and replace them with Minkowski's representation theorem and then you just get two new extra constraints over here. Okay, um, so the trick now is, although, <coughs> if, if, if I give you um, a linear program that has, well, I want to draw something like this. <coughs> if this is a constraint matrix of my uh, linear program, so this is x, and this is my constraint matrix. This is what this thing looks like. It has, and well, x here is lambdas and mu. It has an enormous uh, number of variables. So actually, this this thing is huge. But what do you know about an optimal solution? How many non-negative variables will an optimal solution have at most? If this is M rows. At most M elements of this huge vector will be positive at optimality. So in a way, you could ignore the rest. That's the trick that we're going to play here. We're going to take just M of these variables, ignore the rest as if they did not exist, and then we're going to check if we did the right thing by ignoring them or not. It's the same philosophy as what we did in the L-shaped algorithm, but in the L-shaped algorithm we were throwing out constraints, not variables. We were throwing out rows of the problem, not columns. That's the idea, but now we'll have to back it up with a bunch of theory. So that's basically what I wanted to say about that. The problem is equivalent, we have more decision variables, um, and there's an enormous number of them, but we have fewer constraints. Okay, so now um, let's... Um, Let's now, um, okay, to, so like I said, we only, we're going to ignore um, n minus m variables and work with only m of them, but now we have to come up with a way to verify if the, if the variables we've chosen to be in the basis are optimal. There were two conditions, if you remember, uh, of checking whether a basis is optimal. Um, if it leads to a feasible solution, and if the reduced cost of the non-basic variables is uh, less than or equal to zero. So the f to talk about reduced cost, we need to first look at the columns associated with each variable. So let's look at now what each column of this constraint matrix looks like so we can start talking about verification of optimality. So here's what the columns look like. Again, our decision variables are the lambdas and the mu's. If I take a variable of the type lambda for the first polyhedron, so one, uh, that corresponds to extreme, extreme points, so j, then if I look back at the constraints, where is this a1, x1, j coming from? It's the original linear constraint here, uh, over here. So let's look, where, where does lambda1j show up in this problem? Well, it shows up in the objective function. 
and then it shows up in two constraints. This constraint over here, we have a lambda 1j. This lambda 1j does not show up in many of these other terms, and it appears once in the convex constraint. Okay, then where does the new 1j show up? It shows up again in the equality constraint, but nowhere else. Okay, so a column looks like this for the lambdas. We've got a 1 here. Uh, the other row corresponds to the other uh, the other polyhedron, and we've got zeros for the means. Do these columns make sense to you? Okay. So now we're going to pick a few of these guys as candidates for being in the optimal basis. So what we need to check if the, is if the basis we've chosen is uh, satisfies the conditions for optimality. So again, let's remember. How can we check in a linear program if a basis is optimal? If you throw a basis at me, I will check for two things. B inverse B, non-negative, which means what? It means basically that the basic variables are greater than or equal to zero. And, and the other condition is take the coefficients of the basic variables and subtract the, the optimal the, the corresponding pi uh, transpose A, that needs to be greater than or equal for a minimization problem. That means what? If you do the algebra, that basically means that the non-basic variables have a reduced cost which is greater than or equal to zero, which means that there's no benefit in bringing in non-basic variables to the problem. There's no benefit in moving something that is at zero to something positive. Now, how does this translate to, uh, so we're going to focus on this uh, condition here in our, in our situation. In our situation, a basis, this matrix B, each of its columns has stuff that looks like these guys over here. So let's, um, let's look at what this condition looks like for a variable of type lambda 1j. Again, lambda 1j shows up in the objective function here. So then what we want to do is take the coefficient of a basic variable here. So that the coefficient is this stuff, minus pi transpose the coefficients in the constraints. That's the condition we're going to look for. By the way, um, these columns here, again, remember, the x1j is data, right? When you see the x1j here, you don't think of variable. You're thinking of data. It's, a, it's something that's given to us as data. So the, the optimality condition for a variable of type lambda 1j looks something like the following. Um, coefficient of basic variable in the objective function minus do variable transpose the column. That's the recipe. You want to make sure that if you want lambda 1j to be a proper candidate and um, um, if, if, sorry, let me say this another way. You throw a basis at me. To check if this basis is optimal, I have to go one by one through all the variables and check if this thing, which is equal to this thing, is greater than or equal to zero for all the other lambdas. Okay, again, you throw a bunch of lambdas and mu's that you think are optimal, what I need to then do is go through all the variables one by one and check if this thing here is greater than or equal to zero. Um, for variables of type mu, this is what you're left over with. It's slightly different because there's no one showing up here. Okay. So, how long would it take to do this check Enumeration. Is that something we want to do? Go through all the guys? Probably not the smartest idea because typically you're going to have an exponential number. Just even finding these exchange points is a pain. Um, so there's a trick here though that you, you can uh, do. We notice that these terms are basically linear in x if x were uh, a decision. So instead of going one by one through all the lambdas and the mu's of the polyhedron, what we're going to do is do a minimization 
over x. And if that minimization, uh, uh, and, and well, we'll see what, what the possibilities are. So what the idea of the algorithm was, this is the one big idea of the algorithm. It's important that you understand this, hence I've put your favorite alarm sign over here. And instead of going one by one through all the lambdas and the mu's, we optimize this uh, problem here. We express, we, we forget about Minkowski for a minute, we express the um, polyhedron in its original form, and now we're minimizing this guy here over the polyhedron. If I cannot find, well, well, we'll see what the possibilities are in this minimization and we'll see what conclusions we can uh, make. And, and the same goes for the second polyhedron. Uh, we, we pro I, I propose to you, let's, instead of going one by one through all the lambdas and the mu's and checking for reduced cost, let's do this minimization over here. So what could happen? Three things could happen, basically. What could you say if this problem is unbounded? By the way, before moving on, I want to now start emphasizing some stuff. Uh, we are getting a pi here as input from a master. Okay. The idea will be the following. Instead of uh, solving the um, huge version of the full optimization problem, we will solve a small version of it with the lambdas and the mu that we think should be optimal. If you remember, there were these pi and t1s that T1s and T2s that were generated from this problem, we will send these as data to a sub-problem. So the sub-problem is this one over here and this one over here. So we've taken a huge problem, made it much smaller, but now we have to do optimality checking. So we take data from the, cute, from the reduced problem and send it as input to these sub-problems to see if the lambs and the views that we proposed are optimal. And here's the three things that could uh, happen. Yeah. No, okay, just stretching. Here's the three things that could happen. And this guy could be uh, unbounded. That means what? Um, that means I can find um, an extreme ray. So what will the software send back to me if this problem is unbounded? Do you remember what the uh, condition was? With ne not reduced cost, with negative... It's with a negative inner product. So the, this vector here multiplying that ray is something negative, which means if I go down that line, I can ever, uh, I, I, can, I can push this as low as I want. Exactly what you described is this condition here, basically. So I'm going to get this piece of data, W1R. Ah, well, that's great because now I can tell you something about these few columns that you proposed to me. They're not optimal. Why? Because I found one ray that satisfies this condition here. So if I go back, basically that's the reduced cost of the ray over here, which means the, the proposition you made to me can be improved upon because I found one ray, one new, that you didn't think of including in your uh, simplified problem here that has a reduced cost. So the basis you're proposing to me cannot be optimal. So that's one possibility. If this is unbounded, we found a new mu, a new candidate that we need to throw back into the uh, optimization problem and increase its columns by one. Okay. 
there's another possibility we might have um, <clears throat> the optimal cost being finite but less than t1 so what will I get from simplex if that happens what does simplex give you ah by the way the data I get from simplex here is used to build the new column right this new column that I add uses the output of the subproblem because I'm given a W1R which I use to construct this row, these rows here. Now, if the optimal cost is less than T1, what I'm going to get is an extreme point, an X1J. But what I know is satisfied by this extreme point is that the objective function of the linear program is less than T1. So if I go back here, I know that this reduced cost will be negative. So in this case, what I'm, so here, actually I'm gonna send the W1R. If the subproblem is less than T1, I'm gonna send back an X1J and build a column for a lambda. Okay. And the condition for having actually solved the problem is that the subproblem is finite and more than T1. If the optimal cost is finite and bigger than T1, then I know that this is true for all the extreme points. That means that the candidates you gave me are the best ones. Now the trick is that what have I achieved by doing this minimization? Instead of going one by one to all of these columns and checking for reduced cost, I did a, I just solved two linear problems. So the, um, the philosophy of the algorithm is you take a, you use Minkowski, write this out as this enormous uh, thing, you just take a small piece of it, propose a, an optimal solution, throw data into two sub-problems, two linear programs, and check, are they optimal or not? The checking is very easy, you just solve that piece. And if they're not optimal, you send data back that helps you build Okay, none of this is really big if you think about it. And this grows little by little. You're adding one column at every iteration, but it's better than the full thing. Okay, that's the philosophy of the algorithm. So this is kind of what I've described already. This is just saying, instead of taking the original s sets here, J1, J2, R1, and R2 that are huge, just look at a much smaller uh, subset of extreme points and extreme rates. That's the idea, yeah. So right, um, that is something that is, you can do kind of something like a phase one of simplex that will give you a basic uh, feasible solution and then uh, that will get you started. Uh, with the algorithm. For specific problems, you can do even more specific things. Okay. Now, um, let's look at an example, I think. Okay, so this is the algorithm, basically, that I just uh, described to you. Um, ah, okay. Nothing about what I said um, is I showed you a, uh, a uh, linear program with two sub-problems. Nothing about what I said needs to be applied to a linear program with two sub-problems. You can do the exact same idea with capital K uh, sub-problems, as long as your linear program has this structure. In fact, you can apply the same idea to a... Uh, linear program that looks like this, where you just want to get rid of these constraints. Uh, so if this whole thing is difficult to solve, but by getting rid of these constraints over here, you get something that's simple to solve, you can apply the exact same uh, idea. So this looks like a, you know, a single, uh, basically there, there, there is no clear structure here of two sub-problems, but still the idea can 
Okay, so examples. Uh, yeah, we're going faster than I expected. It's a good idea. Okay, so let's look at this uh, linear program here. Minimize, we have three decision variables. Minus 4x1, minus 2, minus 6x3. This will act as our complicating uh, constraint. And we have um, these other three uh, constraints here. Well, six of them. So the idea here will be to apply, uh, when you're thinking of applying Danzig Wolf, you want to think, OK, I'm going to apply Dan Minkowski's representation theorem on some polyhedron. So what, what is the polyhedron that we're going to apply it to here? It's this uh, box over here, which represents these three uh, constraints. How many extreme points does this box have? Eight. Eight, nice. Um, so the complicating constraints will look like this. This will be the A matrix and the B vector. So let's see what the uh, idea is. Now, supposing someone told us, well, in this, in this problem we can eyeball a couple of extreme points. Um, can we get the process started with one <coughs> extreme point? Uh, it's not enough to build a full rank matrix here. Uh, so what you want to get, what you want to have in order to get the ball move? Well, actually, no. Sorry, you, you could. Uh, you will have a full rank matrix. I want to say that you can start with one extreme point, but here we're going to start with, with two. Um, so the two extreme points are 2, 2, 2 and 1, 1, 2. So how does uh, Minkowski apply here? What we want to do basically um, is the calculations that are going on here. What we're going to do is uh, the following. I will replace it with this thing here. Okay. And I will also add the constraints that lambda 1 plus lambda 2 are 1 and non even So that means if I return to my original problem here, my complicating constraint looks like 3x1 plus 2x2 plus 4x3 equals 17. So what does this become? In terms of, as a function of lambda 1. Mm -hmm. What's the coefficient of lambda? After I do all the substitution here, yeah. six. I'm not sure about your answer, so six. Okay, so let's see. Uh, yes. No. No. Yes. Uh, yes. So what we have going on is. Uh, So six indeed. No, sorry, uh, not six. You have it showing up also here and here. So what we get is six from x one, 
plus 4, 10 plus 8, 18. That's the calculations that I'm basically doing uh, over here. So what we get after we do, is this clear? Okay, so 18 lambda 1, and then for lambda 2, the coefficient is 13. So what we get after we do all this business is this, and then we also have this uh, equality constraint here. So when we're looking at the uh, restricted version of the full optimization problem, and we're considering these two extreme points with their corresponding lambda 1s and lambda 2s, we have a, a, a reduced master that looks like this. Do you, can you? Can you say something about the objective function of this problem compared to the optimal solution of the original problem? Bigger. Coming in? Negative. Your claim, ah, okay. In the, but can you compare it to the optimal solution of the original problem? The full optimization problem that we started with. So this one over here. What do you mean by comparing the Okay, Z star equals the solution of this problem. There is some Z that solves equal to the solution of this problem. Can you compare Z star and Z? If it were the same, then we solve this mini version. Okay. And we're done. Think of um, so you're you're claiming that this will be a lower bound. What are we doing basically by hmm? right? The idea is the following: um, when we are if this is our original optimization problem and we're solving over this full polyhedron, the trick of the uh, dancing wolf algorithm is it'll take only a few extreme points and extreme relief. For example, um, these, guys, uh, these guys over here, one, two, and three, and it will solve the optimization problem for these extreme points, which means basically a convex combination of these three guys. So it will solve an optimization problem over a subset of the full uh, problem, which means that the solution of the restricted master is an upper uh, bound. Okay, uh, now that said, this is how we formed the uh, restricted master problem. We solve it. We get an optimal solution uh, with lambda 1.8 and lambda 2.2, and we keep the dual multipliers as input for checking the subproblems if we have optimality. So, what will the subproblems look like? Um, let me remind you of what the <coughs> Some problems look like in general. So, um, in our situation here, we have minimize minus four x one, minus x two, minus six x three.
So when, when we're formulating um, a subproblem, what we write out is something like this. Now, you've, you've checked that after the solution of the restricted master in our case, we get pi equals minus one, and t equals minus four. So what would you write out for example to check optimality of number one and number two? This is the original whole problem. So we've come up with a candidate. It has, it's a weighted combination of two extreme points. The weights are these. And we've detected two optimal multipliers. How can we use them to check if this is the optimal? What is C transform? Correct. So basically, the C vector. Plus, because it's minus minus one, plus A. Where A is this row here. Okay. So the row of the complicated strings 3, 2, and 4. And we multiply this vector with x1, x2, x3. Subject to everything. Subject to how many constraints? Which one? Remember where we applied Minkowski. We, we applied Minkowski to get rid of, of a bunch of stuff. And we use lambdas and views. And we have to restore Minkowski in the subproblem. Basically, this is our subproblem. And this was the polyhedron on which we applied Minkowski. So in our case, the constraints of this optimality checking subproblem restore Minkowski, but in its original form, not the lambda So it's basically the three, yeah, well, they're basically six. <clears throat> this will be our, the, our check for optimality. And three things again could happen in this uh, subproblem. So basically, what I just wrote there is this guy over here. Okay. Um, so, what will happen when I'm solving this guy is I will get a finite um, solution. I will get um, a 
and will be equal to minus 5. Okay, now let's think of what this means. So this linear program will give me a new point, 2, 1, 2, an objective function, minus 5. When I was presenting to you the algorithm, if you remember, three things could have happened. Is the optimal cost minus infinity? It is not. Is it finite? It is. Is it less than t? It is, because t is minus 4. So what do I understand from this? I understand that the extreme point that is reported to me as output from the subproblem needs to come in. He needs to be part of the candidate. That means I need to associate a new weight with this extreme point, a lambda 3. And I need to build a column for this guy that I will throw into the restricted master. What does the column look like? It looks like this here. Okay, so A, the complicating row, times B extreme point. 1, uh, well, in our case we don't have 0 because we're only approximating 1.8. Now, what does AX then look like for this uh, column? Sixteen. So that would be uh, three, two, four, two, one, two, six plus two plus eight, sixteen. So a new column becomes, uh, for lambda 3, becomes 16 and 1. So I've now enriched my master. Uh, the new master will look like this in the second iteration. Okay, so now there's three players that are uh, complete. You know, contributing to the polyhedron, it's these three extreme points. If I solve this guy, I get a new optimal solution <coughs> that will only use two of these extreme points with equal weight, lambda 1 and lambda 3. And the dual multipliers are minus a half and minus 13. So what I need to do again is build the, the subproblem that checks for optimality. The subproblem that checks for optimality, by the way, is almost the same thing as if, as the uh, original. It's just that we're just uh, tweaking a bit the objective point based on the information we got from the master. Um, okay, so uh, that said, so we, if we build now the, well, I think you get the idea of how we build the subproblems. So what we get is a subproblem like this. Now the optimal solution becomes 2, 2, 2. And the objective function value is minus 13, which is equal to the minus 13 that we found from solving this new restricted master. So the minus 13 shows up here. That's a verification of optimality. That means that, so that verifies that this is the optimal solution to the problem. Well, I haven't told you a next. Here. So what's the optimal length? keeping only the first and third extreme point and we're putting weight of half on each. Okay, so a geometric um, illustration of what just happened is the following. This is Dixie, which is not as easy as <laughs> was uh, imagined. Um, so in, in Bertima's book it's much clearer what's going on. 
the box is the is not the full constraint set of the problem. It's just the stuff that we ended up approximating with the box. Okay. The great uh, part is the intersection of this box with the complicated constraint. What we're doing uh, in the algorithm is we start off with these two guys and solve a restrictive master. So these two guys, 2, 2, 2, and 1, 1, 2, are here. So that's basically this little point over here in the corner. And 1, 1, 2 is x2 over here in this corner. We're playing only on this line for starters in the um, restricted mass. What we end up finding as an optimal solution to this restricted mass is this point A. And what happens is we discover that this point A is not the full optimal for the problem. And what the subproblem tells us is you need to add uh, uh, this guy over here, 2, 1, 2. So that's the point in this corner. And what happens in the second iteration is we have only x1 and x3 contributing to the optimal solution. x2 does not contribute. So we end up having half of x3 and half of x1, and we land on this point B in the second restricted master. Then we check in our sub problem is that guy optimal? It comes through as optimal, we terminate. Um, now, back to my original question, could we have kicked off the algorithm with maybe only two to two? two. Now I'm not sure about the answer. Oops. So what would we do? I think we I think it works. Um, I think all you need to do is it's gonna be kind of a trivial solution, but it'll give you a pi and a d for automatic checking. How would the restricted mass have looked like if I started on with two to two? Yeah. Uh, correct. Subject two five nine eighteen. Lambda equal to seventeen. Lambda equal one. Um, then we have a phi here and a t. I mean, it's a pretty stupid problem, right? It's not very interesting as an optimization problem, but you will get um, you will get input for checking optimality in the software. If you get somehow lucky and you by chance chosen the optimal extreme point in your first iteration, you're gonna call it. I think what I get, I'm quite sure I'm saying this correct. So you can just start with one extreme point of your uh, feasible region. Now here you would have to have some kind of generous, right? That, that's the that's idea. When you have a restricted master that has fewer extreme points than the number of rows in your complicating constraints, uh, sorry, than, than the number of variables in your original problem. No, what I'm saying is incorrect. You don't need to be generous. It, it could very, very well, yeah. You can start the algorithm with one extreme point. Okay, uh, let's take a break. And yes.
Come again? Yeah. Of extreme points and extreme rays? Um, okay, so there is no guarantee that it will. Um, okay. Okay. Um, it could take an exponential number of iterations. What I've shown you here is one version of the algorithm where we are building up a restricted master step by step. You could be throwing away columns. It's another version of the algorithm. So the one guarantee that you have is that it will converge. The reason it will converge is basically what I tried to show you is a specific version of the revised simplex algorithm. So there's using the proof of convergence of the revised simplex algorithm, you can argue that Danzig Wolf will converge. The trick is that you solve the problem, uh, even if it takes an exponential number of iterations, that if you had input it into your machine uh, as it is, it would not have uh, loaded, it would not have even loaded. So, um, that's basically, you know, one of the benefits of the dancing pool algorithm is it, it, you get away with storage, uh, you prevent storage problems. So, composition can be used, even if it takes an exponential number of iterations, it can be used to avoid storage problems. But there's no guarantee it will not take an exponential number of iterations. By the way, for the L-shaped method, same could happen. There's no guarantee. It says it will converge finitely, but we've seen problems with that. I'm going to cover another example, although I think you kind of get the idea. <clears throat> Practice makes perfect. So here we're going to see a slightly different version where we're using Minkowski to approximate two, not one for you, but two. We start off with, and both of these examples, by the way, are taken from the Bertsima's textbook. And, um, it's amazing how clear this book is, so I think you'll find the chapter very uh, helpful. Uh, we take an original linear program with two variables, and we um, add an auxiliary variable to this first inequality constraint here. So we add a non-negative variable x3, <coughs> and we make it a problem in three uh, variables. So what we're going to do is Again, when we're applying that equals, the question is which are the polyhedra that you want to approximate using Minkowski. In our case, uh, one polyhedron will be pretty silly. It will be X3 non-negative. It's a polyhedron. It's a ray. It's kind of a silly one, but it, it is a polyhedron. And then the other polyhedron consists of these two inequalities over here, so it's in a two-dimensional. Uh, space. Okay, so this is the uh, situation. We will therefore treat, since we're knocking out uh, these inequalities through Minkowski, we are left with this equality as the complicating constraint that will always be in the master. And what we get is the following uh, situation. So polyhedron 2 looks like this. It's pretty simple to describe it. It has a unique extreme ray, which is uh, equal to one. And then this two-dimensional polyhedron consists of these two uh, inequalities and the non-negative constraints. Here are the extreme points, and here are the extreme rays. So three extreme points, two extreme rays. So let's do dancing equals on this problem. Um, the, if we looked at the full uh, optimization problem after we apply Minkowski, its feasible region would look something like this. We only have lambdas for the first polyhedron. The second one is just a line. It just has an extreme ray. There are no lambdas. There are, uh, um, the, the whole polyhedron is just a single extreme ray. So then, 
for the second polyhedron, we just have this uh, new over here. And sorry, I think I might have a typo here. First of all, there should be an A1 multiplying W1. This will happen a lot in the next few slides. I have a lot of checkpoints, so we might find typo. Right, so the typo here is that A1 should be multiplying uh, W1R. Now, there's no A2 because in the original problem, the coefficient of X, X3, which is the second polyhedron, is just one. So I've kind of ignored that. So there's a typo here. I should have A1 uh, multiplying W1R. In any case, this is the full expression of the um, master problem without simplifying it. So now let's uh, see what we can uh, do to simplify it. We will kick off the algorithm uh, from uh, with the following uh, extreme point. We have a single one for the first uh, polyhedron, and we will kick off uh, also the algorithm with the extreme ray of the second polyhedron. So what, let's write these out. <coughs> What will the master look like? The restricted master over here. You gotta get used to this idea of plugging in Minkowski. So what do we have? We associate these variables with these. What should happen here? Um, how can I write out X3 equivalently when I'm using this X3? Express X3 as something with me to one. So the idea again is that uh, Minkowski says take any extreme point of this point of the hit them with a lambda, take any extreme rays, hit them with a mu. Um, the extreme, I don't have any extreme points in this situation, I just have an extreme ray. I hit it with a mu, so the x3 can just be re-expressed as the mu. Um, so wherever I see x3 in this problem here, I will re-express it uh, with a mu to 1. For the x1 and x2, I'm now writing any vector that lives in this uh, space here. I'm rewriting re it as a convex combination of the extreme points that I'm considering. So what will it look like? I'm only considering one extreme point. So the x equals the x1, x2 is equal to a convex combination of the extreme points that I'm considering for this polyhedron. What is the polyhedron again? It's x1 minus x2 less than equal to 4, and 2x1 minus x2 less than equal to 10. So any x that lives in this uh, space here uh, will be expressed as a convex combination of this extreme point. That's a pretty simple convex combination. Uh, it's basically lambda times the extreme point, where lambda 
equals one, because there's only one extreme point. So everywhere I see x1, I replace it with six lambda. Everywhere I see x2, I replace it with two lambda. That's the rationale. So how can I now write my restricted master when I'm only considering these guys as describing the problem? Which constraint should I draw from the master, first of all? And what should I do? What have I gotten rid of with the new Did I get rid of this? That stays. These are away, and also the inequality constraints go away. So, and everywhere I see x1, 6 lambda. <coughs> Minus five times six lambda, one. one. The super, the subscript denotes the first polyhedron. The superscript denotes the first extreme point of the first polyhedron. Sorry for this, but once you read through the chapter, you can get used to the application. And so that's x one. And then plus x two is uh, two lambda. One lambda. Subject to x1 plus x3, and I know x1 is 6 lambda 1, 1. x3, I've re expressed it through its extreme ray. Question is, am I done, or do I need to add any more stuff? Say that it's one thing missing. We've almost put the part from this, there's one more thing missing. Minkowski is, it says, convex combination of extreme points, which means. This is my restricted master. And that's what I get here. So let's double check. Minus 30 plus 2 sounds good, right? Minus 28. 6 lambda 1, 1 plus mu 2 equals 8, looks right. And now I'm indexing the t multiplier by 1 because. This is a convexity constraint of the first polyhedron. We have two now. We don't have a convexity constraint for the second one, so we'll go and directly check with this class. But in any case, the subscript of T here refers to the fact that it's a convexity constraint of the first polyhedron. So when we solve this master, what we get is. <coughs> this output. Now let's try and write the first subject. Let's start from the easy stuff. What should this look like for the first subject? So, uh, which one do you want? This or this? Uh, so, this, again, this is what we applied in Minkowski on, this is what we bring back in the sub um, And for reduced costs, so objective. Mm -hmm. 
Just write out the full little three so I don't have to rewrite it or plug it into it. Problem. We solve it. We get okay. Here's what we get: W one one equal one two and unbound. Okay. Remember the um. Okay, so now the new information here is we've got to add this extreme ray to our description. Is it here? How do you do this? How does that work? I'm good. This one? This. This one is the ah okay. We solve this problem. Simplex tells us unbounded, and as a proof of unboundedness, it gives me an extreme ray. When you solve the in simplex the linear program, it reports unbounded and it gives you uh, an unbounded ray. To see that the ray is unbounded. If you do minus five, if you do minus five one times the extreme rate, you will get something that is negative. So I can move in this direction. I will never violate these constraints, and I will make this my a small thing. That's the proof of unbounded. And so CPLEX cannot just tell me if your problem is unbounded. Also, give me data to verify. But I'm going to use this data. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah. Now, um, okay, so let's rewrite uh, the master. What do we need to do? Okay, let's, well, let's start from how do I re-express, okay, does, does X3 change, we, I, well, let's uh, re-express the X1 and X2, so what's the new way to write them out? extreme point, but now we also have an extreme ray. What, how does Minkowski say we use the extreme ray? Mm -hmm. That's mu times the ray. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So then we go back to the no problem, we plug that stuff in and so I think you get the idea, right? We we plug in this expression now for x one and x two. So what we're gonna oops, what we're gonna get from that is something that looks like this. Okay, I'll just do the objective uh, function for you, so, so you see how we get it. So. And then, uh, so what we have is six lambda, 
the plan of one plus the one one and um, x two becomes two lambda plus two mu. And if we draw the algebra, we just are left over with this expression here. Same for the constraints. And there is another typo here. Um, there is no mu two one. It's just mu one one. No, sorry, mistake. Uh, there's mu two one. It's sex. So there is no type of here. Okay, we solve the restricted master. And why didn't why didn't the complicating constraint not change? Why did the complicating constraints remain unchanged? Um, I think this might actually be a typo. So, x1 has now become 6 mu, 6 lambda plus mu. And then we have plus x3, which is mu 2 1. So I think I need to add a plus mu 1 1 over here because I'm running a bit out of time I will I'm assuming this is a type I won't go back to any notes to double check that I think there's a type here in any case we solve this we get the multipliers minus 3 for pi and minus 10 for for t1 we build again the sub problem using this recipe and what we get is um, a new solution 6 2 objective function value minus 10 equal to the dual value of the convexity constraint verification that as far as the polyhedron p1 is concerned we are okay we do the same check for the second polyhedron we check the reduced cost of the extreme ray of uh, the second polyhedron it's also non-negative so we are verified for optimality. Uh, what is the um, what is the vector? The optimal vector? You need to use the extreme come again? That's for the x1, x2. And then for, so this becomes uh, whatever. Uh, six. And then for x3, it's just zero, apparently. And yeah. That's for, well, again, a slight typo here. This should be x1, x2. Uh, okay, so here's geometrically what's going on. Here I'm only drawing um, the x1, x2 part of the space and how the algorithm evolves there. We start with this uh, starting point, 6, 2. So um, these black circles are the extreme points of the polyhedron. The polyhedron is this gray, well, it's not, I should maybe gray it. It's this area over here. We start from here, and we then bring in to the basis this extreme ray over here, and we eventually move to the optimal solution, which is uh, somewhere up over here. X1, X2 equals H6. Yeah, it's along this line over here. Okay, so that's kind of the evolution. 
in the book you'll see much more detailed notes. Okay, that's enough of examples. Now, bound. We already came up with one bound. Uh, upper or lower? Upper bound. Again, the rationale for the upper bound is that the restricted master problem is a constrained version of the full problem. And so at each, at each iteration of this process, we get an upper bound. There's also a lower bound we can get. And it's given by this uh, formula over here. <clears throat> okay, a, a re reminder of notation. Z star is the optimal objective function value of the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, Zi is the objective function value of these subproblems, the second stage subproblems here. And Ti are the dual multipliers of the convexity constraints. And little z is the objective function value, not of the full master, so not z star, it's the restricted master with the fewer lambdas and the fewer means. Okay, so like I said, earlier, the restricted master will give us an upper bound. But there is also this lower bound. Uh, we take this, the ob objective function value of the restricted master, and for each subproblem, we uh, take its objective function value minus the dual multiplier from the restricted master. So maybe if I draw it order. question, let's see the Okay, um, it's, okay, so here's the proof. This is the dual of the full massive problem, the real thing. Um, so these are the inequalities that correspond to the Lambda 1 j's, lambda 2 j's, mu 1 r's, and mu 2 r's. And what we will want to show is the following. We will want to show that P and z1, z2 is a dual feasible solution for this problem. Okay, that's what I'm going to argue uh, right now. Um, and here's how we show that. So if Z1 is finite, I'm claiming that these two, oh, and there's another there, sorry, there's another type over here. This should be this should be less than or equal to zero for all r. This is really sloppy. There should be a comma here and a comma here. Um, let's, just, let's just focus. Yeah, this is really bad. Let's just focus on the uh, first inequality. So the claim is that if I find a z1 that is finite, um, then this inequality has to hold. Anyone have any ideas about why that should be true. Let's look at the... If 
g1 is finite, this inequality has to hold. g1 is the subproblem. The, the argument here is the following. If this inequality did not hold, I could find an extreme point in of, of this polyhedron here. So the H, H1Js correspond to extreme points of this polyhedron. This is the constraint set of this object. If this inequality did not hold, I could find an extreme point that uh, does better than um, that does better than Z1. And that would contradict Z1 being the optimal solution of the subproblem. Okay. Again, the argument here is that we have a bunch of inequalities that are supposed to hold. They're supposed to hold for every extreme point. Um, and the reason they should hold for every extreme point is that if they didn't, I could find another extreme point in this constraint set. It could uh, be, it could result in an objective function value that is lower than Z1 that would contradict Z1 being optimal. And this, uh, well, this uh, expression being less than or equal to zero also follows because otherwise the optimal solution of the subproblem would have been unbounded. That's the idea. And the takeaway is if you, if you look at these inequalities one, after I corrected typos and you compare them with these inequalities here, the takeaway is that if Z1 and Z2 are finite, then these, this is a dual feasible solution for that problem. Why? Because if I plug in, uh, if I replace T1 with Z1 here, these are the inequalities that I just argued should hold. So this is a dual feasible solution for the dual problem. Uh, that's information now, because from um, since, since B Z1, Z2 is a dual feasible solution, th that means that it's, it has to be greater than or, equal, uh, or less than this thing here. Um, so, by transpose B plus Z1 plus Z2 is dual feasible for that problem. So should it be greater than Forget the original problem and simplify. And this is feasible for that problem. Hence, um, so it's it's basically greater than or equal to that uh, object objective function by it's it's a feasible solution, not necessarily optimal. So we get one inequality here. From weak duality, we know that the optimal solution to this guy is less than or equal to the uh, true optimum of the original problem. So we combine these two inequalities to get the result that I just uh, argued earlier. And there's an example in the book that proves that. 